particular picture that I have taken, and I'm going to show it to you in a bigger picture, but it's also on the DVD. It was a picture of a lady in that Hindu temple in uh, New Delhi. And this lady was very interesting. She was very reverent. By the way, when you go to Buddhist temple, Hindu temple, Muslim temple, you have to remove your shoes. And you have to keep completely silent. And there is security guards there because they guards, they are big gods made out of wood and they have dressed up those gods like you wouldn't believe, like beautiful white gold, beautiful clothing. And this lady came with a basket. She had a basket in her hand. I took that picture so I know exactly. Very reverent, she didn't even notice I took the picture. And she had a basket in her hand and in it I could see some fruit and some flowers. And then she came in front of her god Vishnu put it on the altar and reverently bow down and let these people can be rich, I believe. They're just searching. There is a spirituality in them that they're searching God. I really believe that. So that's why when we turn now to the Bible, we can understand the reason why these people are searching. Let's turn to our Bible again because that's where the Word of God is and that's why we need to understand what God is telling us in His Word. So turn with me to Genesis 1. So in the beginning, verse 1 says, God created the heaven and the earth. And then, of course, it goes on and tells you all what He created, which is very fascinating. And then when you come to the sixth day, He created the animals, but then He created us. And let's turn to verse 26 where it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created him, male and female, created them. So chapter 2, verse 22 and 25, we're going to read 22 and 25. Let's turn to 22, chapter 2, 22, and it says, well, let's look at 21. Um, the Lord caused a great sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his rib and closed up the flesh and there instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So here we have Adam and Eve that are being created in chapter 1. In verse 25 it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So here we have Adam and Eve. This is just a basic picture of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And they're happy. And they were naked there, but they were not ashamed. So this is a representation again of God's beauty and covering us with His beautiful light. Now, we're going to turn to chapter 2. Again, we're still in chapter 2. But let's look at 16, 17. The Lord, 15, 16, 17. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat is thereof, you shall surely die. This is interesting because it's chapter 2. They have not separated themselves from God yet, and yet death is mentioned. Death is mentioned because the Heavenly Father knew the consequences of disobedience. So as we see chapter 1 and 2, I like to think that it's like a marriage. God and man, his creation, are one. This is the beautiful instruction. They are one. They are at one. Most people do not understand the word atonement. Well, the word atonement, what it means is at one. Do you see it in there? At one. Right, right here. Atonement. At one. And so when man in chapter 1 and 2 was at one with God, it means they were together. They were Together, they were like married together, like a couple get married, they are at one. And there was no separation at that time. The word atonement means reconciliation, to bring back at one. But they were at one right here. And they were naked and they were not ashamed because they were covered with the light of Christ. 
Now, you want to know more about this too. There's beautiful books like, I have a wonderful book here. It's the Spirit of Prophecy books. And it's actually Patriarch and Prophet. And I have found a lot of good instruction in these books that complete my understanding of the Bible. I don't argue with people who do not appreciate them or do not believe in them. That's their loss in a sense because when you don't study them, you will not know what you're losing. But I believe that these beautiful books are instructors, they are teachers, they are guidance, they are disciplines, just like the Word of God gives me disciplines when I read it. So they are complementary to reading the Word of God, that inspired book. So here we have now one and two where man and God are one. But then comes trouble. The beginning of the trouble on the earth is actually chapter 3 of Genesis. Sin does not originate from earth. Sin originated in heaven, which is kind of difficult to understand. That's why when you start teaching the sanctuary, be prepared. People do not believe that there is sin in the sanctuary in heaven. But the sanctuary does not teach that. The sanctuary teaches that sin has been transferred to the sanctuary. And that sanctuary, the tabernacle, is a representation of the sanctuary in heaven, which we will look at in this next session. So let's go on now. Genesis 1 and 2, they were at one with God. Genesis 3, they separated from God. So here we have Genesis 3, the sad part of the Bible where you and I, 6,000 years ago, got in trouble. Verse 4 and 5 says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Hey, remember what God says? You eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. It's almost word for word, verse 17, and go over in chapter 3, verse 4, and here is God saying, you will die. The devil said, you're not going to die. And who are you to believe? For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. So there, the devil lies, like he always does, and... Here is Miss Eve or Mrs. Eve. She believes him. I'm telling you, trouble started here. God says you will die. The devil said, uh-uh, you're not going to die. And now, who are you to believe? This is the whole point of this presentation. Who are you to believe? Well, if you don't know, then you're going to believe anything and everything. And you're going to look at anything and everything and hear anything and everything and eat anything and everything and touch anything and everything. That's the purpose of this whole series. And I'm going to show you that Christ knew what to believe and who to believe. And that's what made the difference with Christ's life on the earth in this body of flesh and your life and my life and why we are not able to conquer. We're gonna learn that. This is very practical. This is what we need to know. Why are we here in trouble? Why our mind says no, but here the midbrain says yes. Why? Well, we will learn that. And here is what Mrs. Eve got in trouble with. She says, I know God says that, but the devil says it. Hmm, I wonder who I'm gonna to decide to turn to. Who am I going to turn my wheel to? And Genesis 3 shows you that she turns it to the devil on Anthony. Verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she saw. Remember? She saw and she heard. So she uses her senses. She saw and she heard. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, wisdom, she thought, she took up the tree thereof, so she used her hands, so this is the touch. So she used her eyes, her ears, her touch, and she ate it. So there you go. So I'm sure she smelled it too, must have smelled pretty. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did it. He did eat. So here we have Mrs. Eve and Mr. Adam that they see, they hear, they smell, they eat, and they touch. They use their five senses. And they approve of that through their mind and through appetite, passion, and desire, they fall. So what has happened to them in Genesis 3 is what now we're going to learn. What happened to their mind that was not like that in Genesis 1 and 2 
And now, 6,000 years later, you know, and we're told until the time of Christ, it was about 4,000 years of sin. We don't know exactly how long they were in the garden, but we are told in Genesis 5 that Adam, turn with me to Genesis 5, Adam, in Genesis 5, it says, verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Well, where is, that? Where is Cain and Abel? Well, Abel is dead by then and Cain is gone away. Well, that is not very long to be in the garden, is it? 130 years and trouble has already come. And talk about dysfunctional family. If your family is dysfunctional, take hope. The first family was dysfunctional. Dysfunctional family exists because of sin. But we have a Savior that wants to fix family. So as we look at Genesis 3, verse 7 and 8 now, we see that Adam and Eve realize that they're in trouble. They're in real trouble. And verse 7 and 8 goes like this. They knew that they were naked, and they sued, fig leaf together, and made themselves apron. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the tree of the garden. So here, one minute, they are one with God, and the next minute, they are hiding from God. And here is God saying, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God wants to be with his people. He don't want them to go and hide. He doesn't want them to be fearful of him. He made them. And I find it interesting that in chapter 3, verse 21, God in his kindness sees that fig leaves would not work too well. So he, unto Adam and also into his wife, did the Lord God make coat of skin and clothed them. That should remind us of dress code, doesn't it? How do we dress when we want to represent Christ? I have heard that the more, the closer you draw to God, the more you dress. The further you draw from God, the more you undress. And that, my friend, is real. Look at the world today, how immoral the world is. There is not anywhere that you can turn your eyes and see nakedness. Nakedness was in chapter 2 of Genesis, people, when men were one with God. And when they separated from God, they saw they were naked. I don't say it. The Bible says it. The Bible says it. The Bible says that they were naked and they went to hide and they covered themselves. Even between each other, they covered themselves with leaves. That's very flimsy. That's probably what most people think. They don't read the next verse where it says, but God took some skin and dressed them up. And flimsy clothing for God's people is unacceptable. For men, women, or children, we need to dress. And here we have a beautiful quote that I'd like to read from Education, page 15. When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. Isn't that beautiful? We were like our Maker, a likeness. But what has separated us? What has made us what we are today? If you're dealing like me with alcoholism, drug addiction, and all kind of problem that we see on this earth today, oh, the likeness of God is gone. Lots of people do not represent God anymore. Not only in their facial countenance, but even in the way they behave, in the way they speak, in the way they eat, in the way they smell, in the way... I'm serious. I'm serious. Prison... I work in prison, I work on the street where I live, and people are not representative of God's character. And we must restore that. We must help people to restore their dignity, their self-esteem. Look at Isaiah. Turn with me to Isaiah 59, verse 2. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquity has separated between you and your God, and your sin have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's why God seems so far away sometimes, because we're separated from him because of our sin. And there is a wonderful quote that I really love, and um, it's in French that I find that the meaning means more, because it actually says that we are separated from the presence of his character. 
This is basically what I believe is the truth. We are separated from the presence of his beautiful character because of sin. Sin is the transgression of his character. Doesn't that make more sense? We have all these beautiful words in the Bible, but sin is a separation from the character of God, and we are denied his presence because if we were to stand before the Heavenly Father right now, we would be destroyed. We would not stand. We would be totally destroyed. So basically, that's what this chapter is all about, chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Education, page 26. I was asking one time, what is the, the, the knowledge of good and evil? And as I was reading the book of Education from Mrs. White, she says, page 26, you may want to learn this quote, where once was written only the character of God, the knowledge of good. She says that. The knowledge of God, the character of good, was now written also the character of Satan, the knowledge of evil. So my friend, this is the reason why we no longer represent only the character of God. It's because since Genesis 3, the character of Satan has come into our mind. And we want to do good, but we do bad. And we don't understand why is that battle is going on all the time. And the sanctuary gives us all to return to the character of God. All to submit our will to God again. See, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 1 and 2, they were one with God because their will, by faith, belonged to God. But in Genesis 3, they submitted their will to another, and he was not their maker. He was created just like us, and yet he pretended he knew better, and Adam and Eve believed him. It's not sad, but you know what? Don't feel too hard on them. 6,000 years later, I still do it. You still do it, or maybe I'm the only one here on this planet doing it, but I still do it. At times, my passion, appetite, and desire take over my reason, intellect, and conscience, and my will falls on this way. Oh, it can be little, you know, something little like driving and not following the speed limit. And things like, you know, they're tiny. They're not like the big, big one, like, you know, like killing and lying and stealing. I mean, the big, big one. They're the little one. The little one that nobody even knows. But you know, they're still separating me from the character of my Heavenly Father because He's not like that. The law of the land is the law that now I am to keep unless they force me to disobey God's law. Yeah. The knowledge of evil, the curse of sin, was all that the transgressor gained. There was nothing poisonous in the fruit itself. Education, page 25. So I'm encouraging you to read Patriarch and Prophet, chapter 2, 3, and 4, because this chapter, and even chapter 1, but chapter 2, 3, and 4 shows you, chapter 1 is when God and man are one, and then chapter 2, 3, and 4 is when they separate from God. So now we have Adam and Eve that are separated from God, and they have to be dressed with skin of animals. So that obviously required the death of an animal. It's not sad. So here we have now one, two, and three, the file number two and three from the website that teach you simply from Genesis one, two, and now we're going to look at one, two, three, and we're going to look at four. Why are we separated from God? So this is what we're going to look at in the next session and how all this comes together in the sanctuary. Let's finish this session with a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you that you have showed mercy for so long. Thank you for being so patient. Help us to understand. Help us to appreciate your patience and your love. In our Savior's name, amen.